Hey everyone, I'm Savannah Marshall coming at you from USA in Massachusetts. Play the drums, love it. Nice. June Boyce Tillman, Professor of Applied Music, University of Winchester, UK, Professor at the North Northwest University of South Africa, composer, and performer, and choir leader. Thanks, June. Anybody else like to introduce themselves? Gillian Hall, I'm in Melbourne, Australia. Nice. And is that really sunset behind you or is it a full screen? No, no it's red dirt, but it's not where I am. Okay. <laughs> Great. So, so the, 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 we have got about 40 minutes for this. So that's quite nice, quite relaxed. Um, but um, it's, it, I want it to be as challenging as possible. I want to, to somehow, from my point of view, I would really like some actions to come out of this for everybody in this room. So something that you do that changes your practice some action that you take out that changes what you do tomorrow. Um, so that's what interests me. Sam, I've known for uh, four years. We met, in, we met um, through a connection with a, a charity funder in the UK called Youth Music. Um, we were putting together a presentation for the ISME CMA in Glasgow. Um, and um, and I, I think, I, shall I introduce you or can you introduce yourself, Sam? Would that be good? Um, yeah, I'm happy to introduce myself. That's fine, Pete. <laughs> there you go. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Samantha or Sam is fine, Spence. Um, I'm assistant head of Ening Music Service, uh, who is the lead organisation of our music education hub. And those of you from the UK will know what they are. Those of you who may not know, um, we have music services in each of our boroughs areas and um, a few years back, we were converted to be what we call music hubs um, on the understanding that rather than trying to provide services to schools ourselves, we would um, partner with more organizations, community groups, um, charities to make sure that we could broaden the scope of our offer um, to better meet the needs of the children and young people who we serve in um, music education. So that's a little um, snapshot of what a music education hub is. And as Pete said, yeah, we met Four years ago, um, I was part of a, um, a group who presented on various matters, and my topic was um, building a diverse, diverse workforce. Um, just to give you some context, there's 123 music education hubs in the UK, and uh, I am one of three um, black and minority ethnic. I will call myself black. I will use the term black to mean black and minority ethnic, or BAME. I'm one of three in a senior position out of all 123 hubs. Now, if you think about the population, we're serving, you know, 8 million children, 25,000 schools. I mean, there's, there's so many children out there who represent my cultural group and yet in the field of music education and music in itself. I mean, it's one of the most diverse forms of art form that exists and yet it's just woefully represented um, at higher levels within my organization. I don't profess to know much about community music other than my personal experiences. It's very much within the formal education sector. So you may be able to present to me some statistics, I never say that word, statistics, <laughs> which are slightly brighter, possibly not. Um, so just to kind of share some of the things that I, I've been working on, um, you know, we're all aware of the terrible death of uh, George Floyd and, you know, the movement, the Black Lives Matters movement, which has definitely been brought into the fore. And I feel quite um, heartened by what I consider to be a bit of a shift in consciousness over this. I think for me personally, I'm in my 40s now, it's the first time I've seen so many different people of different colours and races actually coming together to um, collectively say, no, this isn't right. But not only that, what are we going to do about it? I've never seen this before in my lifetime. Um, it was quite hard for me as a person, I was very affected by it. Um, but what I noticed was that there wasn't a lot of conversation happening in my workplace, among my, my peers. Um, we ma I manage a team of 55 um, teachers, about 25% of them consider themselves black minority ethnic. And it was just kind of this thing that happened, but nobody said anything about it. And, you know, and it came back to people feeling just a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit unsure. And I find myself guilty of that. You know, I didn't want to share my feelings. I didn't want to speak my truth. I felt um, embarrassed or I didn't want to make people feel uncomfortable if I sort of said, oh, you know, they were saying, well, we should say something about Black Lives Matters. What should we say? And it got me really angry. Like, this is not a buzzword. You know, this is, this is something which is 
we are experiencing as, as a group of people. And yet I didn't feel that I could speak out until literally I cracked one day in a meeting and I just burst into floods of tears. And I just said to my um, head of service, I'm not okay. And if I'm not okay, there's loads of people out there who are not okay. And there's loads of children and young people out there who are not okay. And we, needn't, we shouldn't be avoiding these conversations and I should be allowed to not be okay for you to go, okay, what can we do to help? How can we help? And if I'm feeling that way and I'm an assistant head of a music service, and I feel, you know, I can hold my head up. I'm British. There's lots of people out there who are feeling similar to me. So I think what I wanted to try and do was to get people to really think about diversity as not just a buzzword, not just a ticker box exercise. Obviously, it's much more than that within your organization. If you think about um, different worldviews, different perspectives, different life experiences, I mean, it can absolutely strengthen any organization. Um, and I think that this is a real time for people to say, OK, let's make some meaningful change. So I guess it's to really open up the conversation to the field of music, music education, community music, and start looking at our organisations, start questioning our, our, our motives, our actions, our, um, our, our work, our practices, our attitudes, um, and also think about what kind of impact we can have on all children, young people, but maybe at this time, especially those who might be specifically affected by current events. Gonna, yeah um so thank you thank you very much at what at this point what do you think how 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 do you think your the way you got into your job and your work progression what were the chat you know did you have to fight what happened to you that made it possible for you to you know so you've arrived and you're now in quite a powerful position but you're one of three and so those three and those 123 must have a specific story. So what gave you that? What made you kind of yeah. somebody that you saw went, yeah. So I, I kind of had to battle with a lot of things when I was younger. I'm a string player by trade, viola, violin, piano. And I'm not, that's not unusual. The numbers of children who are, are black, who are learning classical instruments in our schools is very, very high from primary level right through to secondary. Um, but then there's a drop off. It's like lemmings, you know. Um, and some of you may have heard of an orchestra called Chineke, which is now championing um, a specific orchestra of musicians who are and identify as being black and white. And I think it's a real shame that we have to do that. But if you look at the other orchestras in the world, there's hardly anybody of colour in them. So I was definitely, I was one, I was the only black person at the Purcell School of Music when I was there. Um, and it was a horrible experience. I hated every minute of it, but I loved music. Um, and it just it just connected to me and I, I refused to my parents helped me I refused to kind of let that stop me but uh, it was very difficult um, so I went through a traditional kind of what you might call a middle class white sort of route to get to um, going to university and studying music education I did my master's at the Institute of Education um, and I continued up up the field but I kind of had to come from a starting place which was playing on the level field and the playing field that my white counterparts were on you know mm. and the reason why I feel that a lot of people who look like me aren't in the position I'm in is that they don't come through that route it's almost like a maze where you go down different pathways and then you get to a dead end then you get to a dead end and then you get to another dead end and unless you do certain things and you can overcome certain hurdles and barriers or somebody kindly opens a door it's very difficult for you to make it through mm. and have there been and in your now you've got a position of power are there actions that you make that that you're making sort of weekly, daily that are, that are trying to open doors and try? Absolutely. To... Absolutely. I mean, I'm very happy to, to share some of them with you yeah, all yeah, now. No, no, um, so one of the things I, I'm very keen to do is to seek out, actively seek out and form partnerships with um, culturally diverse artists and groups in our area. So always looking at who are we working with and what are their practices and what are their values and do they align with ours? And looking at our schedules, looking at our events and just, you know, we have a little um, uh, a card on the table at, at every meeting and it has key words on it. So one of the words is diversity. Another word might be uh, representation. Another word might be 
um, uh, genre, you know, so we always have these, so that I'm not the only one kind of saying, hey guys, can we get some people of colour in there? We all kind of look at what we're doing and say, right, let's, let's, let's address these issues as well. We facil I facilitate and help my organisation to facilitate discussions where people do feel uncomfortable. They don't like talking about the fact that there is unconscious bias there in, in every area of our work. When we're putting together programmes and we end with the proms and it's pomp and circumstance and, you know, we've got William Tell Overture and we've got all of these, you know, Eurocentric music on offer, it's, it's traditional, I understand that, and I'm not saying it should go, but actually, why can't we make a departure from that? Especially if in Ealing, nearly 50% of our population our uh, ethnic minorities and we're still presenting this eurocentric homogenous kind of attitude of what the great composers are and great music so you know i, I kind of help to facilitate those challenges i've also wanna, run a network wanna, wanna th throw just some dave, dave, sam dave, cook dave, in there dave 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 just wait will you please thank you <laughs> yeah, keep going sam um uh, I've also headed up networks um, in, in a previous life where I worked in another borough called Islington. I was the lead of a black educators network. Because the other thing that I'm very keen about is it's all fine and well saying we've got this percentage of people of colour. Yeah, we're doing great. Look how diverse we are. But what does that mean? So what? So you've got 10% of your staff are represented and? In what way is that helping your organisation? Is that on what way is that helping to have a positive impact on the pupils and the children and young people that you serve who are of colour? In what way is that making a difference? Are they moving any further? Are they simply on the grassroots level? Are you providing opportunities for succession planning? You know, it's kind of all of these things. It's not enough just to say we've ticked that box. So the network that I ran allowed us to, as a group to be a critical friend, really, to the council and the organisation and, and basically help to um, challenge and, and, and support, more importantly, things that were happening in the organisation which we felt weren't truly representative and didn't represent you know equity and, and, and accessibility and inclusiveness from our own perspective so we were able to say we actually think that by presenting it this way some people like us might feel this way and they go oh, we didn't think of that that's great um, and part of the organisation also well the network was to profesh professionally help with their development so we had head teachers we had um, the, the only Ofsted inspector of colour. We would have people in senior positions mentoring and working with and supporting the, the younger members of the network who were maybe just starting out as music teachers to kind of see how they could get into these higher positions and maybe overcome some of the, um, the issues that, that they've faced. So that's something else, you know, consider a network. Um, and lastly, mm. don't adopt a neutral stance. You know, I think it's really important for organisations to speak out, to say what you align with, what you believe with, and don't worry about upsetting the, you know, the very vocal minority of people who want us to just stay in the past. By saying nothing, it, it's, it's possibly even worse than, than saying something. So just make sure that, you know, you are, as an organisation, saying, right, this is what we believe in. Make it clear, back it up with action, with actual, not just plod, but with actual things that you are doing to make sure that you are inclusive, accessible and champion all the differences within your organisation. Brilliant, Sam. So thank you. Thank you. I mean, yes, don't, yeah, don't stand. I mean, it's really interesting, the conversations that you have with people in organisations. So can we, one of the things I'd really would like to happen in this is that some of the people who don't normally speak, speak. So some of the people who, who don't, you know, who we haven't, whose voices we haven't heard, kind of throw some questions at Sam or kind of go, yeah, throw, I throw some questions. One, one of the things I, I did when, when this all started off, I actually, and I challenge you all to do this, look in your address book, go through your address book on your phone on, and see how many people you know from, B, in England we call BME, BAME, in Canada you call it BIPOC, isn't it? So just, I'm just curious, how many people of colour are your friends or are in your network? Are, are musicians that you know, are educators you know? Just see, is it three, is it 50? And as a challenge, that's quite an interesting challenge, I would say, you know, because where do you start? You start with your own net networks, isn't it? you know, we have to build our own network. Mm. So, and having would... those conversations, you know, and even if you just contact, if you, I wouldn't say you just randomly contact all the people of colour and you're like, hi, you know, haven't spoken to you in 10 years, but, you know, but have a meaningful yeah. conversation and just say, look, I don't really know where to start. I've had these conversations with my staff. They've said to me, Sam, I don't really know where to start or what to say. I just feel like, I'd, I'd like to hear how you feel about things. I said, great, you know, let's, let's talk yeah. about it. And, and just from that conversation, and, you know, I've had people say, I really don't think I know enough about what's going on. Not only that, how it 
um, how it aligns with what I do in my work. You know, it's so easy to see yourself as, as over here and everything else is happening over there. But actually, you know, they're, they're all they're all linked in some way. So, um, yeah, I think it's Great. really important. Have some conversation and bring that to your organization to the highest level that you can and challenge them. You know, Great. if you're not Thank on you. that level yourself. Emily, yeah. Um, first of all, thank you so much for sharing, and I really value this opportunity to to have the conversation. Um, I wanted to to sort of just open up a, I'm not sure if it's a question, but a, a thought about the kind of decolonize the curriculum movement, uh, what we can collectively do to get more of of what has been, uh, you know, I speak from a UK standpoint, more of what has been our country's history represented properly uh and how we start that shift or how we continue that shift i don't that wasn't really a very coherent question but no no there's i enough think in i understand there. what you mean <laughs> Thank you. i mean unfortunately the, the curriculum certainly sort of a level upwards is, is is really bad you know um everything from representation of female composers to composers of color and then this horrible term world music i mean it's one of the worst terms ever you know this 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 world music every music comes from the world what does that mean you know um so i think it's about looking at the language and also even if the curriculum itself is leaning a certain way i mean i took great challenge with the uh, the new curriculum saying the great composers it to me it was a kind of dog whistle because if you said to people and i did the survey myself who do you think of the great composers most people can only name composers of classical music, Beethoven, Chopin, Schubert, Haydn, whoever, you know, and by leaving that statement hanging in the, in the curriculum document, it leads people to believe that's what should be in there. Um, so I think it's about that interpretation and making sure that whoever is in charge of looking at the, the syllabus, the curriculum, what children actually taught, all the elements of music can be taught through most types of music. You know, it, it doesn't have to be if, if you're looking at notation, if you're looking at form, if you're looking at, um, you know, timbre and tempo, all those interrelated elements of music, as they call them now, can be taught through any musical style. And I, when I train music teachers, I always say to them at the beginning, tell me your favourite music. And then some of them will say, oh, I like indie, I like grime, I like this. I'm like, OK, give me your favourite artist. And I say, when you start with what you love, then you invite your students to share what they love. And then you build your curriculum from there and you look at them and their experiences and their loves and their interests and then take a step back, go to their history, go to their families. You know, we've got a very high Asian, Sikh, Hindu community in Ealing. Um, and some of my teachers are like, I can't teach this music. I don't know anything about it. But they do. Just facilitate the session. You don't have to be an expert. Um, so I think it's really about looking at all your planning getting teachers to think about and having those buzzwords you know right okay i've done my plan have i just regurgitated what i do every year or have i really thought about the students that i'm teaching when i look at them am i catering for you am i catering for you have i got something in here that you can relate to so i think that's kind of where it, where it starts from mm, great great thank you somebody else we've got we've got really we you know i'll just say we've got about 25 minutes in this room this little group don't be shy there's so, no so, questions. But, but have, yeah. Ask whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, June. Well, my then comment Kathleen. was really, it's a question of re-evaluating. I mean, I've been really, I mean, I know Joy's here from South Africa, but the power of that classical tradition, we really have to regard literate and orate traditions as of equal value. That's the fundamental thing we need to do. The literate is not better than orate, and we've taught that for years. And, and the notion of the composer is foreign to the orate tradition, really. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even the very words we used are profoundly different. So it needs a complete rethinking of the value system which underpins our education. And I mean, I, I'm aware that Joy is more experienced in South Africa than I am, but I. I one of the horrific experiences of the Pan-African Society of Music Education, where I was, that a person who was teaching music education said, when people come to me, this is in Africa, uh, the general area of Africa, they have had no music education. I even have to teach them how to draw a treble clef. <laughs> <laughs> and my heart sank. <laughs> I thought, you know, what, where are we that, that any of these orate traditions that are around us all the time are not regarded as music? Yeah. And 
you know, and going back to what you said, that, that, that there was a lovely presentation. When I was teaching in the 1970s in London, uh, two young uh, girls who were eight, I think, uh, they brought, they said they were learning music at the temple and, and they were learning the harmonium as is quite common in relation to the Sikh and Hindu temples. I said, I don't know anything about it. We'll teach you, they said. So every lunchtime I sat down with these two young people with their harmonium and they taught me sa, pa, ba, ga, and, and so on. And somehow or other, the teacher is a learner. We're not, we don't have to be authorities, but if we want to teach people to learn, then we must be learners. And it transformed, I mean, they could learn from me and I could learn from them. So those are two provocative statements about the orate and the literate in Africa and also the practice of being a learner and being excited by what they bring. Thank you, Jude. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Can I, do you mind, do you mind if I... Kathleen's got a hand up. Just come, I'll come back to you, Dave. Kathleen, okay. Yeah. Go on, Kathleen, yeah. Thanks, Samantha. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, a st structured... Um, responses because the position that I'm in I am a course director for a master's program and we um, we take a master's in community music and we take applications from people who have undergraduate degrees but also recognize prior learning so we look for um, musicians from all different kinds of musical traditions oral and classical you know right across um, experiences yeah. But one of the things that I'm finding is in terms of the applications I get, um, even though I think I'm casting the net wide, um, I tend to still uh, get applications from only particular demographics. And I suppose I'm trying to think about structural things I can actively do to change that, you know? Um, and I know there must be things I'm not doing, but I'm just wondering what they can, they, they can be. Like, for example, I'm thinking a lot about visibility. So I know what is possible for me as a young woman in academia, because I have lots of senior women ahead of me who've pushed me on, who've opened doors for me, who've welcomed me. And I really want to do that now. And I'm, at, I'm now at a point in my career when I have the, the capacity and the opportunity to do that. And I suppose I'm just wondering how to best do that really effectively and to broaden it as much as possible to be thinking about um about issues of race and also issues of gender and also issues of um ability disability um yeah so just to be active and i just wondered if yeah. you had any thoughts on that well you know you, you hit the nail on the head there because when you pointed out that you have seen yourself represented that mm. is key. That is why workforce diversity is so, so important because for people to see representation that looks like them, that is the, that is the, I could be president after president Obama syndrome. That is the moment where it changes the lives of so many children. So you kind of want to do a top down. You want to start by looking at hopefully within your organization, what's happening here. Okay. Mm. Do we have representation right at the very top where we are? And if not, again, when you talk about um, broadening the net and getting more people involved, where there's underrepresentation, reach out to certain people in that community and say, look, this is what we're doing here. This is what we're, you know, what we're looking for. These are the issues. Um, where, where is it? Where do people look? Where do people go? I mean, I took umbrage with my work always advertising in Rheingold and The Guardian and very kind of middle class, you know, high level music education um, kind of literature and and and, and um, publications and so forth which immediately excluded anybody whose background wasn't like that now it doesn't sound like you're doing it in that respect but again it may be some very untraditional ways of getting people through the door without not necessarily even saying we've got a job apply for a job but maybe putting on certain training events skills development events um something which encourages people and at that moment at that event saying this is actually things that we're looking at doing we're, we're trying to change here 
we'd really appreciate you helping us you know invite people in have a focus group have an advisory board and be very blunt about it we want people of color we want disabled people we want look at the groups that are missing we want you to help us i bet if you put an ad out and said we'll pay you or an allowance or something to come and support us as an organization just have some conversations mm. you'd get people coming through the door just to say you know what yeah great i, I want to be heard because this is the thing people want their voices to be heard and they don't want people to just say thank you very much for that you know it's actually about saying we want to talk to you because we want you to help us and then taking on board that advice and making that real difference so i think it's finding creative ways to get them to engage with you not necessarily on a recruitment level on another level to have these conversations to find out where and how and why you know they will tell you straight i don't know is it, is it island is it um which yeah part? yeah and yeah in yeah Okay, I mean, like for, in London, I mean, we're, we're quite blessed, you know, there's, there's lots of organisation and places to go to. I don't know the landscape so well in Ireland, but I'm sure there are people there who do. You know, as Pete said, you know, look through your book, who have you got, <laughs> who are your friends of colour, even if they're not in the field of music and just say, listen, I really yeah. need help with this. I'm a bit stuck. But always keep one eye on that top level. Always keep one yeah. eye. If I came to work for you, when am I going to see someone that looks like you, me in that position? Mm. yeah and kind of keep your eye on a slightly larger prize but that would be my advice thank, thank you sam dave i'm gonna dave and then who who wants to speak after dave who's yeah then lorinda yeah i'd like to dave. ask dave's been uh, trying to speak for a long time <laughs> no no it's fine i'd like to ask hey, uh sam a question just about uh appropriation and um you know one of the i think one of the things that i've struggled with with a bunch of like collaborators that I work with um, is am I allowed to do like R and B soul music? And I think uh, we had, we had another presentation uh, last seminar from Denise um, that kind of talked about this and had different perspectives on it. But uh that's that's one thing like right now you know we're all stuck in our homes <laughs> and um so we're wondering like where like where are the lines um in collaboration so i think with regard to uh, pete were you going to say something sorry no i know you you do a bit i'll do answer that as well a bit yeah okay that's good <laughs> um yeah it's an interesting one um I think it's it has to be handled quite sensitively but to be fair some will some won't so what you're not going to please everybody that's the first thing you will find you could talk to me and i'll say yeah dave that's absolutely cool you know why not i love the fact that you're embracing our music and our culture and you'll find others who go oh no 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 you shouldn't be doing that so there's definitely you, you're not going to please everybody my understanding my, my thinking behind it is as long as it's done sensitively with acknowledgement Obviously, after years of colonialism and slavery and, you know, taking of everything possible from black cultures, the thing that people hate the most is when, you know, people who are not of that culture take what they want and then make it their own or claim it's their own or don't give the homage or the respect that it's due. So I think it's about doing the homework, getting the history behind it, giving credit where it's due and making it very clear that this is your way of saying, I fully appreciate and, and respect and enjoy and love this type of music because of X, Y, and Z. And I understand that it comes from here and I understand and relate to this. And that is one of the reasons why I am producing this type of music. And I don't think anybody could argue with that. Yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah, and no, I can't add to that. That's lovely. Um, <laughs> Lorinda and then Joy. This is good, I'm very happy. Are we, is, can I just check, is everybody happy in this room? Is this, is this the room that you wanted to be in? Is this kind of moving? No, I, you know, because I, I, put, I put myself on the line throughout all of these, just trying to keep this agenda at, at every assembly. And so I just want to make sure that, 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 that this is okay. Because it's so important to me. Lorinda, go. Uh, just regarding um, tertiary education, because the start of this conversation was kind of aimed at, at the education um, curriculum towards um, children um, in, at a school age. But um, I did my honours in choral conducting in Cape Town um, two years ago, and I requested to, to take ethnomusicology um, module as opposed to musicology. I just thought as a South African choral conductor, it would have been more applicable. I'd learn more useful information. And I was turned down and 
was it was just unheard of and no you can't do that and you have to take musicology because it's not weighted wow. the same or seen the same and up until today it's one of my biggest regrets so my, i think my question is can these things change on the smaller level if we don't address it on tertiary level if 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 these you know weighing ethnic musicology versus why is it even two separate things and <laughs> yeah and yeah yeah so a while back, Pete and I were also involved in a project called Inspire Music, um, which I'm sure Pete, you will agree, was just fantastic. Mm. I mean, um, and That's we had we this very, we yes, it, it, ah, yeah, it was actually. We had this very discussion as part of the group, um, which was, you know, we can do loads at what we might call grassroots level. You know, you could do stuff with primary school kids. But as soon as you get to A-levels, and university which is actually the key area because you're right you know I could not be in the position I'm in if I didn't get a degree in music and possibly a, a master's I don't know but I'd like to think that wasn't a, a deal breaker but you know it was like that's where the drop-off happens you're absolutely right and for government to change for policies to change for curriculum to change oh it's it's just a never-ending battle you know and it is again something thankfully which is being looked at we've got two organizations here in the uk um we've got arts council england who've recently brought in um uh they have a, a return that organizations mpos uh, non-profit organizations have to give every year and they've brought in diversity tables as part of that for the first time i mean this is in the last couple of years they're actually saying to organizations what's happening here why have you got people at this higher level um and also um music mark and ofsted and the organizations who basically are the governing bodies and a lot more questions are being asked but i'll be honest with you there's a lot more people out there who want things to stay the same and it's just it's a perennial challenge and you're absolutely right there isn't much that can happen until at that higher level policy change takes place and i think that's that's key pete did you want to add to that yeah no it's just interesting the arts council scheme is called the creative case for diversity which i yeah. so it's the creative case it's kind of it's 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 very nice it's not it's it's quite i mean it took me a while to understand it but the creative case for diversity you know make it a make it a creative thing rather than kind of tick box but make it clear that it's going to change your creativity and your whole connection with your audience with your community with the people that you work with and it's a and it's really power it's a very it's a powerful statement um, unfortunately they haven't really got a um a whip hand on it you know <laughs> they're not crossing they are they are pushing people but they're not pushing hard enough i'm going to keep going so i think it's joy next from south africa is that right yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you, Hi. Samantha, for your introduction. It's always um, um, good to hear what, um, what, what your experiences are. And I always learn quite a lot from, by, by listening. Um, so my um, first community music experience was teaching violin at two community music um, projects at two children's homes in um, a low income area in Pretoria. So um, I'm very passionate, especially about cultural responsive teaching and making formal music education, music education pedagogies more accessible in informal settings. So um, your story and especially your spring background resonated very strongly with me. And so I was in the, um, in the UK for the first time in January visiting the Royal Northern College of Music. And I um and to, I think it was Emily that mentioned decolonization, and I remember going to see Kokoroko live, which was amazing. And their last song was called Colonial Mentality. And after like after my stay, I realized that you know the importance of having a song that kind of references the the colonial past, of especially England, and especially living in South Africa with such a like deep historical past of not only um decolonialism and oh, oh, sorry colonialism and apartheid like i do really sometimes um especially as a as a white white afrikaans person really think about my positionality and especially when we are talking about you know or orate and you know the orate and the um liter literate music traditions and that's why um you know culturally responsive teaching really um, resonated strongly with me even though like I know I can't teach certain um, cultural music of South Africa <laughs> um, I do like you know see it as um, 
as June mentioned, as an opportunity to learn. And I'm hoping to explore, you know, especially um, I'm writing an autoethnography about, you know, cultural dissensus in my community music practices and how we can really, yeah, I think it's a lifelong journey to <laughs> engage th through music authentically and especially in, in a diverse context. So if you have any tips on how to, how to go about, you know, cultural diversity in community, <laughs> like sure. in community music or music education, I will greatly appreciate that. No problem. I mean, I, I, I don't profess to have all the answers, so, <laughs> but I have worked with quite a few organizations. The, street, the talk that I was part of with Pete, um, I, I remember quite distinctly, Pete, you might remember as well, that after we finished doing the session, I was sort of packing up my stuff and I turned around, there was like a queue of people standing around and I remember thinking oh I wonder what they're all waiting for and they're all waiting to talk to me <laughs> and I was kind of like oh uh and they kind of were like oh we're really interested in hearing and I really wasn't expecting the response and initially I must admit I was slightly overwhelmed by it like oh no you know I'm, I'm not some guru I just have these views and these ideas and then you know over time I started thinking well actually that they are valid and they're useful and maybe I can help people. So I started to have meetings with people one-to-one -one, and it's about the case by case basis, you know, getting to understand like Kathleen was saying, you know, your, your organization, your, your environment, who you're working with, really understanding your own values and, and that of your organization and then coming up with a plan of action. And most of the time people have the answers, you know, it's not really rocket science. It's just that we're not quite sure how to go about things and does this make sense? So I'm kind of there just to be a bit of a, a critical but supporting friend, you know, like the motivator that makes you jog when you don't want to because they know at the end of it, you're gonna feel really good. That's kind of what I do with these organizations. I, just, I steer them through the, the sea of uncomfortability till we come out the other side. So um, I'm really pleased to hear um, what you've been doing. Make sure the waves are very strong when you steer them. <laughs> um so great this is good irene then leo and then mary okay thank you so much for your talk yeah. and for sharing this with us i um aside from teaching at uh, concordia university in montreal I, I work with the music for people organization which is all about inclusivity and music improvisation of course as all of this came about we were very challenged and yes we looked at our board and uh, you know we engaged in this conversation um, and yes it put us the entire white board into a place of discomfort and we uh, reached out we reached out to members who had come to our workshops and uh, I engaged in conversations. Uh, one of them was with a wonderful uh, improviser from Japan and who is also very involved in a lot of anti-racist uh, work. And we talked for about two hours and I, I squirmed in my seat so many times because she was kind enough to point out so many things that I would say unconsciously. I don't know what I don't know. And, um, you know, and shared a lot of very generous resources too, which one of them decolonizing the music room, which is an excellent resource. Um, you know, and one of the things that came up was um, improvisation, you know, which, you know, which is what we do. And of course, improvisation, I think is even more, well, she said to me, how are you going to teach so many other of uh, different cultures about improvisation when we've been doing it for longer than you have or or she she i forget how she phrased it but just really how would you say an improvisation uh collective could reach out um or is there a place where other improvisation are different improvisation collectives are we really want to make an effort because i we just put our foot in our mouths time after time after time um i'm not entirely sure that's not an area that i have a lot of knowledge of um i might have to defer to pete who looks like he's about to go somewhere no i'm just <laughs> putting my phone on to charge just sit all right i mean all I know is that the nature of our organization is whenever there's a gap whenever there's something that we don't know we find someone who does so mm -hmm. it's it's about you know really just asking around asking around asking around and, and someone will know someone there's a whole load of networks I mean this in itself is a huge network right here mm -hmm. you know so I would definitely say just to explore your networks local groups more regional what what further afield worldwide even um, 
because like you said yeah if they're out there it's out there somehow but it's just putting in that work but once you make it a priority and it sounds like you have done and I love the fact that you said you looked at your board your white board and said hmm okay um I've recently been appointed a, a trustee a board of trust a member of the board of trustees for music um for youth an organization here and they did exactly that they said to themselves you know what we need to make a change here and they were unapologetic about it and I think that's the key thing yeah. is yeah. not skirting around the bush kind of saying listen this needs to change this is what we need to do um but we want to find the right people who can help us and support us from specific groups of society and you're in that group and can you help and if you can't do you know anyone else that can and yeah. just yeah. just putting it out there yeah 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 absolutely great yes thank you leo are you where in brazil are you leo yeah i am brazil in the Whereabouts? south of brazil and where? it's very cold here. <laughs> in, in, where, <laughs> right which now. city? Which city are you in? I live in Cuiabá. That is in the middle of the, of South America, really in the middle of South America. But I am in Porto Alegre, where the okay. the conference, the ISME conference, was held in two thousand fourteen. Lovely city. Oh yes, yes, we had a very nice yeah. time there. Okay, so you, you, what was your comment? Yeah, my comment was about, we do have a network, a Latin American network uh, of music teachers. It's called FLADEM. Uh, actually, it was born within an ISME conference in 1994. But what I was going to comment is that if you, we see this chat room here, how many of us are English native speakers? How many? <laughs> How many? In, you put yeah. your hands up if you're an English native speaker. Okay. Yeah. And how many of us are, are black people? How many of us are indigenous people? Why aren't these people represented at CM, in CMA as a whole? This is my third CMA conference uh, and it's always like it's always looked like this. It's always looked like uh, uh, white people, usually cisgender, usually uh, straight people. Usually, we we do Ismail represent and CMA represent uh, the same status quo as in other places. We should try to think as a as an institution uh, uh, how to be more open to other people starting yeah. with the, the the language <laughs> starting with yes yeah, so we only ever speak in english we never do we never do bilingual um working at all it's really very clear that's been but it's it precisely that leo which is that has inspired these conversations and has pushed me to keep pushing it and the other commissioners to keep pushing it because we were looking and i have to say that it's been the fact that we've been digital has made it more inclusive you know but it's um and but it hasn't taken us nearly far enough um but it's, well, a starting, but it's a starting point even when cma was held in salvador brazil that's one of the blackest cities from from brazil we, we all just saw white hat people <laughs> yeah yeah no we were i remember it was quite scary um can um, I can I just come in on that? Yeah, Sorry, yeah. Um, Patrick, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you for for raising that. I'm um, I'm sure Pete won't mind me saying that I, I challenged him on this very issue when he got in touch with me, um, and I understand, you know, that obviously the the um, cohort of people who signed up, it is what it is. But again, you know, those questions should be asked. So as the first thing I did when I joined the the, uh, the Zoom call was to flick through the various different screens. And, you know, and I, I have to do this when I go to places, I do this, I, I literally yeah, go, yeah. right, let me see how many people. And then I'm always resigned to the fact, okay, so I'm one of two, there's 104, or I'm one of four, or I'm one of five. And unfortunately, it's just a reality for me. I'm, I'm just kind of used to it by now. But like you said, the organization should be looking at it and going, you know what? something's not right here there's an imbalance here we're talking about music education guys you know we're not talking about fencing we're not talking about a sport which is his uh, uh, um, an area which is historically for only for you know the white masses and, and and upper classes we're talking about music you know sometimes I, I, it surprises me that and i know we've got music educators around the world who represent every single group you can think of but you've got to ask the question what is the barrier 
do they even know about this event? How did you all find out about it? You know, if you've got people of color who knew, who you know, did anybody ask them about it? Did, you know, it's like, there's all these things like, what, what's, what's really happening underneath it all? So I definitely think, I know they've held conferences in um, African countries. Am I right, Pete? There has been... Um, the CMA oh. hasn't been. I don't, I don't think the ISME oh, has Oh, I was thinking been. of ISME. Yeah, no, ISME, I don't think, I don't know whether, maybe it was in South okay. Africa, was it at some point? Yes, it was a South oh, African. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And okay, but again, Leo's okay, so, point about, you know, English being the key language and so forth and where they're, they're situated, all of these are questions that should be asked. And the fact that we're having this conversation in this group means that Pete and other people in the organisation can go away and go, right, let's evaluate the conference. Oh, that was good. That worked really well. Okay, let's just talk about this. Because next year, we don't want it to look like this. Like this. So what are we, we going to do yeah. about that? Um, can I just, um, sorry, this just Kathleen or Gillian, could you, uh, my WhatsApp's gone down, so I can't communicate with anybody. So do you want to just find out and tell them to chuck us out of here? Could you, could you ask them for five more minutes? If possible. Yeah, I have to go in five minutes. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> so could, if it's possible minutes. to ask them for five more minutes and then throw us out. Mary, briefly, and then Patrick. So keep them quite short. I'll be very quick. I just want to thank you so much for this talk. Sam, thank you for everything you've shared. And some of you may know this. If you don't know yet, um, in the United States, Ed Sarath has begun. He's the author of a book called Black Music Matters. And he's created, I'm on a task what was that? force. What was his name? Sorry. Ed Sarath. I've got it in the chat a little higher. Yeah, he's a professor at you. University of Mr. Ed Sarath. Um, his book is Black Music Matters. Just last fall, we had a think tank on the Alliance for the Transformation of the Musical Academy. And within that, now there's a task force on musical racism. Ed's a really prolific writer and is, and I put the link up above on the chat for, for ATMA, the Alliance for the Transformation Musical Academy. So just for anybody that's, I mean, this is, this is a huge topic. And I just wanted to make sure people know, at least in the United States, there is efforts toward, um, toward thinking and more critical ways and i'll put in the t in the chat all the names of the people that are on this task force collaborating one of them ted mcdaniels at ohio state university is also on the um national association for the study of african-american music so there's some collaborations going on in that way but boy i tell you i'm in a school of music that really needs some help <laughs> But I've also gone to College of Education that's aware, and we watched a really powerful video about the difference between being racist and being anti-racist. And there's a story, a little nine minute segment on that. I highly recommend that I put up in the chat as well. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Mary, I really love the fact that, you know, we have to, we're educating ourselves. I mean, myself also, make no assumption because I'm a person of color that I know all about my history. You know, yes, of course I know some, but there's so much literature out there, there's so much documentation and American history, you know, I've probably only scratched the surface, but it, the information is out there, you know, and, and, and realistically, there's nothing stopping us saying, hmm, I'd like to find out a bit more about black composers. You know, it's like, if you ask all of your friends who are involved in music, how many black composers can you name? And if the answer is like maybe one or two, Hmm, what can I do to change that? Find out and, and then add that. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. All I was going to say was, I think we lose the chat when we come out of the breakout room. So I don't know, Pete, if there's some way to kind of. Um, I'll see. Three dots this, on the right um, of the chat. You can click that and then. Yeah, save but when the, the breakout room, when the break. Oh, you can save it? Oh, right I now you I can. Yeah. Know that. yeah. Amazing. Thank you very much for that. Patrick. And also, uh, Patrick. We. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, did you have. I don't know. Do do we have time? Uh, Pete? You have a couple of minutes. You have a couple of minutes, and then we're going to get thrown out. So, yeah, I think that. Yeah, thanks, Sam, for for leading the conversation. I think is really important. I do, I think that what I wanted to, you know, to articulate is that you know the visible and the systemic are not always um, the same, right? And and uh, I think that one of the important things for us to to consider in a lot of these conversations is where we started to a certain to a certain extent which is you know access to credentials access to um, institutions access, access to organizational is you know it's fundamental to the fact that we might see in 10 years time you know a screenshot that looks differently than this right uh, the the organization and the willingness of individuals within the organization or Quite honestly, the contact book 
it has obviously an impact, but has a limited impact, mm -hmm. right? If we don't have a much more, you know, structural set of changes that quite honestly, and I'm at a university, uh, depend on access to institutions, right? Obviously, then ISMI has a lot of work to do to providing and inviting and facilitating access to its own institutional structure. But in many ways, almost all of us are working in the field and our professionals, and they're only working in the field because they had access to either vocation or university or college. And those are significantly still the basis. And that goes then back to schooling. I mean, schooling in, the, in, in Canada and U.S. Ruben Gastambide Fernandez, a colleague of mine here at U of T, just did a brilliant study on arts school, arts, uh, you know, high school, arts high schools in, in Toronto, which is one of the most, you know, multicultural cities in the world and showed very clearly that that environment is an environment that is wildly uh, racialized and mm. really colonial. And so I, th I think that we, we have to, you know, at times it seems like is obviously I think it begins with us. I, I, you know, my own trajectory, I was born and raised in Brazil. English is not my first language. Um, you know, from a, a racialized family background, and although passing white, we have to recognize, and I think it is important, the distinction between what is immediately visible and the tendency to go to what is immediately visible, and really thinking about the structural, right? And this is why I appreciate the way, Sam, you started thinking about institutions and organizations and the work that we need to do within them, but also mm -hmm. looking at how do we amplify that work into more and more institutions. It needs to go beyond having people on the board as you articulated. So I, I just wanted to, we, yeah. to bring that back because I think that that is the structural change that is so significant. And that's Absolutely. not going to tomorrow. It's going to happen no, it's in not. generations. Yeah. It's going to, and, and I think that's the key thing as well is not to be, disheartened you know by what appears to be very little gains because you know every day that somebody makes a decision that they're going to call something out every day somebody goes oh actually I've noticed every moment that everybody in this breakout room steps away from here and suddenly it, something that I might have said or somebody said it triggers them to make a difference to do something different to think slightly differently to challenge oh that's interesting I think that all of those little moments, you know, that's what I mean about this collective conscious. I feel a shift. I, I, I sense it. I just hope it doesn't lose momentum, you know, and I think that that's why I said at the beginning, people, you have to speak up, you know, things can't, you can't stay quiet. And this is about everything. This is not just about yeah. Black Lives Matter. Is this about any form of injustice, any form of, you know, situation where you feel like, okay, there's a lack of representation. Even if people want to stop you from talking, oh, just stay quiet, sit down. No, you know, you have to keep saying, no, this is something that's important. And I don't know, one day, like you said, maybe we will look at these screens and, and see a completely different different view. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be optimistic. <laughs> it doesn't Thank hurt. You. Well, you have, sure. no, we, have, we, we have to be optimistic. Nate, in that first, that first week, so Nate, one of the, he said, this, it's a necessity. It's just yeah. a necessity. It's, just, it's not a question. So we're going to get booted out and go back. So thank you very much, Sam. Can I just... Um, so it's, it's really fantastic. I, mean, I tried to get Sam in the first week and it was just too, too many things happening. So I'm oh. so, so, thank you, so, Pete. so, so very thank happy. You, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Can thank I, you, I, need to admit, I need to admit something before we get kicked out. I was very concerned and nervous about doing this. And I kept saying to Pete, <laughs> oh, I don't know anything about community music. I don't you know.